I am Aldo Schlaku. I'm Tracy McKnight, music supervisor and president of Node Records. So Aldo, I'm so happy to talk to you today. Um, and so we're, we're here to talk about your score for the Comeback Trail. So I thought maybe you might want to tell the audience a little bit about the film and how you got involved in it. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity, Tracy. And um, I'm very happy to be here today, finally, to, to talk about the score and about this film. Um, yeah, the film is a black comedy and uh, it has some action um, element to it. And it's a movie within a movie. It's about a producer that decides to shoot a movie with the goal of killing, murdering the star actor so he can collect uh, the insurance money. And uh, during the process, they end up making a great movie and uh, they win the Oscar. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. And uh, I got involved uh, from the script stage because um, I had worked before with a director, George Gallo. And we had just come off from another movie called uh, The Poison Rose. And he had mentioned to me, I have this black comedy that you should take a look into it and, and tell me what you think and whatnot. I read the script and it was just hilarious. And um, I couldn't wait until uh, to start. And I actually I started writing themes on based on the script first. And uh, I joined him on the on the set and showed him some themes. And, and that's how we started the conversation. And uh, some of the themes ended up in the movie. They're still in there. So I'm so happy about that. I love it. Well, we know that the film stars Robert De Niro, Tommy Lee Jones, Morgan Freeman, Zach Braff. I mean, <laughs> Neil Hirsch. Could, could, the, could the cast be any better? Um, and, you know, George has a history of being spot on with comedy. Um, and so as you got involved and started to create themes, um, I, what I found when I watched the movie, which is so enjoyable and so fun, is that you had to create two different worlds. You had to create a, a you had to create the the storyline arc of the emotional arc of the characters, but then you were in a movie within a movie that is a Western. And how did you approach that? Um, with your themes and ideas and and also that the movie takes place in a certain time period. Um, yeah, yeah. So that was had to be incorporated, which is the 70s. Um, so you had a lot of elements to work with um, that you needed to kind of check a lot of boxes. Uh, that was the toughest, the toughest not, not to crack actually, because uh, we didn't want to make it um, too obvious at the same time. Uh, and we knew that there's three blocks to this whole project. There was the movie itself, the Western, and also the failed movies that this producer was making before That's making true. the Western. So yeah, so we, have, uh, we had some funk, 70s funk for the failed movies, like some kind of a, you know, nuns with guns and I don't know, soft porn kind of 70s. I don't know, you know, what you consider those those kind of films. And then uh -huh. we had the Western, which um, was a huge discussion uh, with George, um, how we approach this. And the idea was, um, let's just go as big as we can, as grotesque as we can, like full on, let's play it serious. Like these guys are making the biggest movie ever. And, uh, you know, and make Tommy, uh, Tommy Lee Jones, this, this uh, you know, this actor, former star, like the biggest star ever, you know, like, uh, like a Gregory Peck on a horse or something, you know, or, and, uh, and that was the idea. I didn't want to do uh, a Morriconist uh, kind of an inspired score right. because it would have been kind of an easy way out, I guess. I don't know. It's very characteristic to go with the spaghetti Western thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we said, you know what? No, we're going to use a full orchestra. This is the time to just go for it and do like a, you know, ins get inspired from Bernstein scores or Steiner or Tiomkin, mm -hmm. the famous, uh, the famous, um, westerns of prior to, let's say the 50s the golden age and yeah. Um, and yeah so and then there is also uh, the the actual score for the film uh, for that one uh, i wanted to do a dark a darker score because the guy is planning to kill someone so <laughs> you know there's a bit of darkness <laughs> into that and but i wanted to play it orchestral i want to keep a bit of consistency when it came to sound so Staying with the orchestra was something that we decided to 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 uh, to hold close to us because that would have given us the consistency of the sound. 
for that for that section of the score, um, I want I wanted to use a leitmotif uh, uh, concept like Wagner. You have a, a leitmotif, a theme that actually just keeps going, and then you you play with the harmony as you go with that leitmotif. Right. And uh, I th I did want a bassoon for Max Barber, which is De Niro's uh, character. Uh, for some reason, I. I had the bassoon thing in my head since when I read the script, and we st we, we stuck with it, and and it ended up staying there. So it's a gorgeous score and beautifully executed. And um, I think you've had you had some adventures when you um when you went to record it. Yeah, we recorded the, the orchestra was recorded in Berlin. Um, so there's this uh, service called Scoring Berlin, and uh, Tom Roosevelt, the engineer that I use for all my scores, he runs that service. And uh, I did tell, actually he, what he did is that when I was looking for an orchestra, uh, I, of course, LA is the, the first one that comes to mind or London, but the budgets did not allow me to, to do that. And I did not want to go to uh, the most economic places. And, um, and I, as I contacted a few people, Tom included, Tom flew to LA to come to my studio and he said, I'm here to talk you about your score i'm like this guy's nuts what is he doing here so <laughs> was that your first had, time in berlin scoring in berlin? yes yes but tom came to la like three months before i was about to record and he convinced me that look you come to berlin we'll take care of you i'm like this guy's nuts <laughs> like, what are they doing like i mean the level of commitment was like whoa and uh, it impressed me and i said you know what let's just do it yeah let's go for it I went there and I decided to score and to mix in Berlin. I didn't want to take the sessions back to LA and start from scratch. And so I decided to record there, spent two, two and a half weeks recording and mixing over there at the same time. So um, impeccable uh, performance, impeccable uh, attitude, uh, involvement. You could tell everybody just wanted to do the best they could. Um, so I was very, very, very impressed with, with everything. Like wow. 100, 150 percent, another 100, another 120, 150, like literally. Yeah. The orchestra was in Berlin. The choir was in uh, uh, in Macedonia. We did that in Skopje. Oh, nice. Yeah. Did and, you do that uh, remotely? Yes, that we did remotely. It it was only I, I think about six cues that we had, so it was mm -hmm. not a big session. They did an amazing job. I told them, I said, I want some, I want a bit of a, a bite to it. They're like, oh, Clint Eastwood. I'm like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you think, it's good. <laughs> it's just, uh, they nailed it. Uh, the funk the funk band was done in, uh, in uh, Nashville. Uh, and the soloists were done in LA. Nice. The acoustic guitars, the 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 ethnic flutes, the harmonica, uh, all these uh, specific soloists were done in LA. So fun doing the nun funk um, must have been <laughs> like just writing that. And it's so, so great. It plays over, over the end of the film, but it is fantastic. So tell me a little bit about that. Like, like was there was inspiration? Was there was it Parliament Funkadelic? Was it but, wow? I'm just going back to my seventies. <laughs> Well, it's funny. I mean, George shows me this uh, this footage. There's some nuns in a car shooting AK-47s, Kalashnikovs, and it didn't make any sense. You know, nuns in the 70s in the U.S. shooting Kalashnikovs, and they're like, you know, their decollete is like huge. It's just kind of didn't make any sense. What? And I said to George, you know, let's have fun with this. It's like, yeah, let's just, you know, funk 70s, James Brown, and I'm like. Let's go for it. I'm a brass player myself. So I'm like, you know what? Let's have a brass section. Let's get a rocking uh, group, you know, rhythm section. And let's go. And Nashville, yes. So <laughs> you got it there. Yeah. <laughs> That's really awesome. Um, so we thought we'd talk a little bit about um, like some of your influences, you know, um, you know, being a film composer or, and, you know, being a, me being a music supervisor, our influences come from, from different areas, but just tell us a little bit more about your about your background and and maybe some of your your influences along the way. Well, I'm classically trained. I've been in music since five six years old, and that was it. So I went through schooling, did my undergrad in Montreal uh, in composition, and uh, then grad school at uh, USC. 
film scoring, worked for Chris Young for a few years as his assistant, and then um, I went on my own, and uh, I'm super good friends with uh, Chris now. Uh, he's one of the most generous people ever and has helped me a lot, and, and um, so that's pretty much my, my path. Um, when it comes to influences, um, I would give you my, uh, my uh, five uh, names. Of, uh, I love it. So it starts with Bach, then it goes to Beethoven, then it goes to Wagner, then Mahler, the all-time favorite, and then of course I have to have Stravinsky in there as well. So <laughs> I love has it. To be. When it comes to film composers, I would say Morricone and uh, Jerry Goldsmith are the are the ones that. Of course, there's numerous composers that have defined the the, the profession, but these two somehow hit hit a little something that I'm ooh. you know from your, your history of being involved with music from such a young age and being classically trained I'm always curious about the moment where um, a musician a composer someone who who writes music and uh, performs it says aha film scoring right because you can go in lots of different obviously lots of different directions with ballet and modern dance and uh, concertos and but then there is this tribe that kind of says oh, I'm going over here and what was the what, like I know I had my moments as a music supervisor um where I was like wow like that was my aha moment and like mm -hmm. there's a job called music supervision you know and when I realized what it was I was like okay that's for me mm -hmm. um but did you have one of those moments? And I, I call it my aha moment, but it, it, the moment of like, oh yeah, I can do this. And I believe that the most beautiful thing and the thing that's sometimes I don't think is spoken about enough with composers, um, film composers, story composers, is that um, there's a really beautiful, unique talent as music helps support a, a story. Mm -hmm. um, that there's lots of people who are wonderful uh, musicians and can do lots of different things, but the unique gift is taking what you what you know and then appropriating it to of course a story. And so, tell us a little bit about that. I've had two moments actually, not one but two. Uh, one time, uh, both of them in Albania, believe it or not, very strange. Uh, one of them has been when I was, I don't know, 10, 11 years old, first time they bring me to this ballet to, to see uh, like ballet. And it was this ballet called Lola and written by this Russian composer of um, 1890s, somewhere in there. Very, very classic, very classic. I can't remember his full name now. Uh, but when I first time heard that music with the, the ballet happening, I'm like, oh, stage music. Wow. Like, super impressed and then the moment that defined the whole thing was when i was seeing my mother on stage um on a theater play uh, uh the death of a merchant uh, here in albania they had schubert serenade playing against one of the scenes in the theater and i'm like mesmerized i would watch that play every night go to the theater to watch my mother there and get you know, mesmerized for that moment and uh, it defines my, you know, subconsciously, I will write music for the theater, for the place, because that I, I, I associated stage music with that moment. So in Montreal, when uh, I finished my undergrad, the idea was to what to do, how to proceed to masters and to potential PhDs and so on. I knew that I did not want to go for the, the teaching path. Right. Too young, too young to to teach. I mean, you got to do it first and then teach. You know, talk about it. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and the film, the film, I had done a feature at the time, actually in Montreal, as a composer, and uh, it, it just clicked. It was a click thing. And I decided to go to, uh, I put three options. One of them was London, one LA, and one was Rome, actually, believe it or not, with Morricone. <laughs> and I decided to, I said, I'm going to go to three places to see it what it is and then decide which one. Sure enough, I came to LA and I saw the program at USC and, and and I saw their recording sessions at M stage at Paramount and I'm blown away by the musicians. I'm like, this is it. I'm coming to LA. It's a phenomenal and, uh, program there. Like amazing. I mean, but when I saw the musicians, when I saw the musicians performing, 
a prima vista, like you put their music in your music in front of them and they were like just playing it. It was insane. I'm like, these guys are not humans. <laughs> these are... Yeah, so it made me come to LA. And of course, once you come in, you see people like Chris, like other composers working and then you're like completely immersed into it. There's no drawn, coming out. Drawn into the world, right? Oh, yeah, yeah that's it. So um, yeah, that, that, that was it. But both my parents were theater actors. So I've been exposed to uh, the stage and the music since a very young age. Um, and uh, yeah, film was the most uh, logical kind of um, path. Well, what's interesting, just to circle back to the comeback trail, but, um, and what really struck me when I watched the, the film is that really it's, I mean, it's your music from beginning to end. You know, so you're such, it, the music is such a big character in this film and the way you navigated the amount of music that you have in there. And that's the beauty um, and the genius of film scoring um, that you're able to weave into this storyline. And, and I think people are gonna be so excited watching this film that it's charming and funny and, um, and emotional and, um, and, and, and truly like hilarious, like really hilarious at times. And I think, wow, being in a music department, um, I was thinking about how much fun you like, had to have to navigate um, the through lines of all that and how beautiful your work is from beginning to end of the film. Um, you did a wonderful job. Thank you. Well, I have to give credit. I have to say this actually, and I truly mean it. I have to give credit to, to George uh, because uh, it's not, it's, it's, we take it for granted at times. So I have to say that uh, once you find a director that gives you uh, wings and uh, lets you do your thing and is completely behind you um, and part of the process, like, okay, let's go for that. Let's try it. Yes. Oh, wow. You know, and it just felt like uh, let's let's be honest with every type of music that we're doing for the film. Let's just be honest and let's just go for it, you know. And let's write a theme that we love it and we like it. Are we happy? Great. Let's go for it. So it felt like um, we had no no restraints. Um, and I would play something for him on the piano. It'd be great. I'm like, is he joking now? What? He hasn't heard anything yet. It's just on the piano. But George is a musician himself. So he, I, when I was telling him, I'm thinking of bassoon here, he's like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. I'm like, yeah, and then the English horn could come in and take it. Love it. I didn't even have to try to explain to him what an English horn is or, or stuff like that. So of course I did mock-ups. I made mock-ups because mm -hmm. I didn't want to risk anything. And I was curious myself to see if, the, if a big orchestra, like a hundred piece orchestra would would work you know right. and uh, because uh, I, we said let's go big and let's go like this is the biggest western ever with three with three horses on set you know but i wanted to test it and see what the grotesque would look like you know and it actually worked and you put a theme there and it's like he's conquering the world tommy lee jones on a horse you know so, so and here's the here's the here's the superstar on the western. You see his portrait there. It's just like he's, oh my God, he's, it's, he's the best. You know? it's, he's absolutely. Uh, I mean, they're all amazing, but he is just like yeah. he's genius. Uh, the, the John Wayne, you know, the John Wayne of this movie. <laughs> you know? So uh, actually, yeah, another thing that George had come up with an idea, which, funny enough, I'm the one to tell him. I'm not sure we should go for that. George is like, how about we do an overture? let's write an overture and let's have like a five, six minute of just music to open the movie and nothing happens. Like George, I said, in the time of Netflixes and Hulus and so on, do you think that people would sit down and listen to six minutes of an overture before the movie starts? What do you, what do you I, I'm like, I want to go for half hour of an overture. You know? <laughs> but, uh, and George is like, well, you may have a point, but think about it. And actually I did think about it. And uh, the end credits is that overture, believe it or not. So uh, the end credits is actually the piece that was conceived as, as the overture of the movie. And it's so, epic and amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, it really goes, is. It just goes all over the place and uh, it has a bit of everything. And like an overture on an operetta or opera that it just gets you uh, into the essence of the story and then you get into it. But instead of in the beginning, we have it at the end, so. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, we are, <laughs> 
at Node, so excited to be releasing this and working with you to, um, to bring this soundtrack to the world. Um, it's an honor and it's so great. And I think we're gonna have a lot of fun um, getting it out there into the world. And I can't thank you enough for um, spending some time with us today and hearing all about um, the journey. Yeah, thank you so much for finding a home for this uh, for this score. I really, truly, truly appreciate it because uh, you know there's people like you out there that that hear something they want to you know put it under their their wing and and find a home and nurture it and and let it out for people to hear it. And that's that's what I I mean. It's a dream come true for me because you write music, you want to let it go and let people hear it. And that's my job is to compose and then that's it. I'm done. So so thank you for for finding a home for it. Yeah, it's like it's it's we're so lucky that we're able to take, you know, our mission for the labels that we just love composers and um and wanting to create a boutique where we can really shine a light on excellent work. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, the next chapter of uh, one more soundtracks together and being able to show um, the score to the to the comeback trail to the world. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Tracy. It's so good to see you, Aldo. Thank you. Same here. Thanks.